Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks to ARM for putting on another fabulous event. It's great to be here. Uh, and thanks to all of you for making time to listen to the Regenix Bio story this afternoon. I'm Faraz Ali, Chief Business Officer uh, for Regenix Bio, um, and uh, look forward to conveying a little bit more about our company in the next 15 minutes. Uh, Regenix Bio is a publicly traded company. As such, I'll be making forward like good statements. You can learn more about the, the risks in our 10K. Um, you know, just to refamiliarize you with uh, Regenix, that's the first time Regenix has been back on the platform here after uh, after a, a while. Um, like many of the companies here, we're seeking to improve human life through the curative potential of gene therapy, in our case, AAV gene therapy. What we're probably known best for is um, exclusive worldwide access to the uh, more than 100 vectors that were discovered by Jim Wilson at the University of Pennsylvania, including the Sentinel AAV7, AAV8, AAV9, and AAV RH10 vectors. Collectively, we refer to these as our NAV technology platform that has a proof of concept of efficacy, safety, and durability that's been demonstrated in uh, literally hundreds of preclinical studies, and now importantly, in the multiple clinical studies. And I'll talk about um, some of them today. Uh, it's been an exciting year for us. Uh, this is the first year that we started dosing patients in our LEAD2 programs. That's RGX314 for wet age-related macular degeneration, as, uh, as well as our RGX501 program for homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, in both programs, we will be providing interim updates on our clinical studies by the end of this year. So it's an exciting year for us. Uh, in addition to our wholly owned programs, we also have our partnered programs. So there are more than 20 programs that have been licensed to third party licensees, uh, including eight that are either at clinical stage or approaching clinical stage, which provides additional proof of concept uh, uh, of the approach. Um, importantly, to drive all of this forward, we are well resourced and have the right team in place. Uh, as of uh, the end of the first half of 2017, we had more than $200 million in the bank, and importantly, we have a management team uh, that really can bring this all together. And, and to emphasize that point, um, you know, Regenix has really come a long way from its early origins as a licensing shop, which is some people still remember it that way, but we're now a fully integrated company. We have capabilities at every, in every bench, in every chair around the table, uh, including um, Olivia Danos, um, who's a leader in gene therapy in multiple contexts as our chief scientific officer. Uh, on one end, we have manufacturing excellence in Curran Simpson. Um, uh, myself, I did commercial uh, launches in orphan diseases in US and globally over nine years at Genzyme. So we really are now a team that's come together. We have the resources, we have the plan, we have the intent. We have the mission to drive AEV gene therapy into the clinic and, and, and into commercialization. We make, I think that makes us a very attractive uh, partner. Um, and Jim Wilson, of course, is not a part of the company, but remains a very special part of the company in, uh, in the form of a, a special advisory role. This is our, uh, a slide that we've put up often to describe our licensee network. Um, there are 24 programs represented here at various stages of development um, in, in, in four different therapeutic areas. Perhaps the most well-known is Avexis, uh, which has demonstrated outstanding clinical efficacy using our AAV9 vector in a terrible disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, this this uh, chart uh, is always dynamic. We did a have a new addition uh, a few months ago. Uh, you can see on the left, uh, Prevail Therapeutics, uh, which was uh, formed in collaboration with the Silverstein Foundation and Orbimed to tackle Parkinson's um, associated with the GBA mutation. So we're excited to add them to our licensing network. This is our own wholly owned pipeline. Uh, you can see four programs here. Um, uh, today, in the time that I have, I'll talk a bit, little bit about our RGX314 program and 501 program. Those are elite programs. I won't have as much time to talk about our RGX111 program uh, for MPS1 or our RGX121 program for um, MPS2. But taking a step back before diving into uh, uh, our 314 program, I did want to reflect on the tremendous diversity that this pipeline represents. You have three different organ systems involved, um, the eye, the liver, and, and the brain. You have three different end products represented here. You have an enzyme that's being delivered, a secreted enzyme in the case of MPS1 and MPS2. You have a receptor in uh, and, and the liver in the form of our 501 program. And you have a uh, monoclonal um, 
antibody fragment uh, in our 3.4 program. And you also have three routes of administration here. You have IV, you have subretinal in the case of the eye, and you have also intracerebral ventricular delivery to the brain. So this pipeline really masked a lot of underlying diversity, which also in turn represents a tremendous amount of know-how that has come together uh, to have a pipeline like this, which we think positions us very well for future success uh, in these indications and in other related indications. So a little bit more on our RGX314 program uh, for the treatment of uh, wet AMD. Uh, this is not an orphan disease. Uh, there are more than uh, 2 million uh, individuals affected by this disease in the G7. And the incidence uh, is also on the rise because of an aging population. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this. It's one of the leading causes of blindness uh, in the developed world. Um, VEGF inhibitors like Lucentis and ILEA have been around for years um, and that have been demonstrated and they give us the proof of concept that this, this mechanism of action, uh, of action can prevent and reverse uh, new leaky blood vessel formation. Um, however, they're associated with very frequent, in some cases, 12 or more injections a year to the front of the eye that can be painful and comfortable. But most importantly for this population, it is difficult for them to remain compliant with this regimen. And what that leads to over time is a loss of efficacy. Those original gains that are seen in vision uh, eventually uh, in the real world context are lost. Uh, we think that with uh, our product candidate, a single dose administration, we can address that. And uh, not only, uh, it's not just a matter of convenience, but actually a matter of restoration of vision. We use the AV vector, uh, eight vector, subretinally delivered, uh, and the gene, as I mentioned earlier, is an anti-VEGF fragment. Uh, this has been a field which has had past failures. And so I thought it would be important to remind the audience of why we think we're different. We think that our RGX314 product candidate has significant advantages over prior efforts. Um, when you look at the comparison with the prior Avalanche program and the prior Genzyme program, uh, we're using the AV8 vector versus AV2. We're not using the SFLIT as the transgene, but actually this anti-VEGF fab, um, which again has demonstrated proof of concept in humans in the form of ILEA and Lucentis. And our right of administration is subretinal. So collectively, we think this, trans th this translates to a very different product candidate. And, and some of the proof of that is in the far right column uh, that measures the maximum expression of protein in the interior chamber uh, of the eyes of non-human primates. And what you can see just numerically are orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitude of higher expression uh, at the back of the eye, which is where you need it. Um, so uh, that, make, that gives us some uh, reason for hope. What you see with the graph on the right is that uh, after a single administration, there's a sustain, uh, sustained expression uh, at the back of the eye, which goes out even longer than the period represented on that graph. Um, in addition to changes in the actual product candidate, there's also changes in the way we're running the study. And today, in the time I have, I can't go into all those details, but we have learned from what didn't work well in the prior two studies and incorporated those learnings into our study. It is a um, multi, multi-center um, dose escalating study. We have six of the best uh, centers really in the United States involved here. Uh, these are people who were KOLs who were involved in the original approvals of both Lucentis and ILEA. Uh, they, uh, we, we are treating up to 18 patients. Uh, we did recently announce that we completed the enrollment of the first uh, cohort, so six patients have already been dosed. Um, the KOLs and the sites are very pleased with the progress that we uh, are seeing here, and we're, we're very pleased as well. It is a safety study, but we will have the opportunity to get efficacy measures, including surrogate markers like retinal thickness in the form of OCT measurements, but also uh, we will be measuring actual BCVA to look at visual acuity, and we'll also be looking at the, uh, the need for anti-VEGF rescue injections if necessary in this study that will help inform then future studies. Very excited about the study. We have committed to providing an interim update by the end of this year. Next up, uh, RGX501 for familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, this is a terrible disease. Patients, uh, children are born with uh, defective LDLR receptors, and as a result of that, they have uh, limited to no functioning in these receptors, which means that they have a dramatic increase in their circulating uh, LDL cholesterol levels. Um, and to put this into perspective, uh, the goal, uh, the stated goal is to be at 100 or less, 100 milligrams per deciliter or less. Uh, these children and eventual adults, they have greater than 500, and we even know they're patients who uh, are approaching 1,000. Um, so that translates to tremendous uh, amount of uh, burden of cholesterol, leads to uh, coronary artery disease at a very young age, and even with existing standard of care, uh, uh, there are individuals who are dying of heart attacks in their 20s and 30s. So it's a really terrible disease with a high unmet need. 
Uh, and it's an ultra orphan population, about 11,000 worldwide. Um, in this case, again, we're using the AV8 vector, this time uh, delivered intravenously, uh, targeting the liver to deliver a positive healthy copy of the LDLR gene. Uh, and this is our proof of concept in humans. This is our, uh, one of our reasons to believe. Uh, this is in a mouse model of, uh, of, uh, of the disease. And you can see in the graph on the right a rapid and sustained decrease in circulating LDLR um, um, uh, cholesterol levels, uh, getting down to the normal range. And importantly, on the, on the graph on the right, you see that this actually translates to a, a regression of um, atherosclerotic lesions and, and, and a reduction in the amount of plaques. Uh, we hope to uh, obviously replicate these, uh, these findings in humans. Uh, speaking of which, uh, this is what our study looks like uh, there. Again, this is a, we're, we're going to have two doses. Uh, this is a single site study being run out of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, this is being done under the guidance uh, of Dan Rader, who um, is a major uh, figure in the field and, in fact, was responsible for the development of the first and only treatment for HOFH in the form of lamidipide. Um, and now he's very motivated to work with us on this study, which uh, has a curative potential. Uh, and again, over here, the primary uh, endpoint is safety, but we will be looking at um, reduction in LDLR uh, levels um, as an important surrogate endpoint for efficacy. Um, and again, this is another study in which we will be providing an interim update by the end of this year. I said that I didn't have a lot of time, and I can see my time is running out, uh, but I did want to touch on at least on RGX111 for uh, MPS1. Uh, and I'm, uh, I was going to flash up uh, RGX121 for MPS2. Uh, these are both uh, lysosomal storage disorders. Uh, both of them are multisystemic in nature, but both of them ha are also associated with profound neurodegeneration. The current standards of care uh, for MPS1 and MPS2, all durazime and allopraze respectively, they're IV administrative enzymes, both of which do not cross the blood-brain barrier. And so you still have the uh, unresolved issues of the brain uh, that cannot be addressed with either of those therapies. Uh, Intrathecal administrations are being studied, but that's not a sustainable option. Um, so what we're trying to do is deliver a single dose of the respective genes uh, and involved in MPS1 uh, and MPS2 using, an, in this case, an AV9 vector, which is demonstrated in humans who have fabulous tropism uh, in the brain. Uh, what, what I really wanted to highlight about this study, uh, both of these studies, is that uh, we did spend a tremendous amount of time in collaboration with uh, Jim Wilson and the team at Penn understanding route of administration. Uh, we, we explored intravenous, we explored intraparenchymal, we explored intrathecal, and we explored um, uh, intracerebral ventricular in multiple animal models. And, and the conclusion was that the best approach here for these diseases, when you have a rapidly progressive neurodegenerative diseases, going intracerebral ventricular is the right way to get the right amount of enzyme fully circulated around the brain. And we've been able to demonstrate in animal models uh, reduction in multiple compartments of the brain. Um, so we think that um, positions us well for success. Um, the primary focus here is on the CNS in both of these diseases, but we think that the combination of AEV9 as a vector uh, that has been demonstrated to be efficacious in the brain, a, a, a intracerebral ventricular um, route of administration, uh, that that sets us up for a nice platform that if we can demonstrate results in these indications, then we can tackle many other uh, neurodegenerative diseases with this platform. So we're very excited about that. Uh, in the case of MPS1, we uh, have an active IND, and so we're beginning to prepare sites uh, for that first patient dose, which we've committed to doing in the first half of next year. And in the case of MPS2, we um, are going to be submitting our IND before the end of this year. So it's an exciting time um, for us, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, across all of these products. So in conclusion, uh, I hope I've been able to, uh, in, in my short time here, uh, reintroduce you to Progenics Bio, uh, convey to you sort of the breadth and depth of uh, our platform and our capabilities. Um, we think we're um, well positioned for success. It's an exciting year for us uh, with an important clinical catalyst uh, coming up ahead in these two lead programs as well as other lead programs. So an exciting time over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and uh, we think we've got the right team, and we've got the resources to power us forward, um, and we think we're the you know, leaders in AV gene therapy and our partner of choice for folks out there who are considering dipping their toes and uh, jumping into the field of AV gene therapy. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>